Okay, this is part two of Photography as Art, lecture number five. So I'm going to begin by talking about the Barbizon School of Painting. Barbizon School of Painters sought new artistic subjects in the commonplace landscapes outside of Paris. Their work was an escape from tradition and held strong the value of democratic freedom in choosing a subject, the wild and open Fontainebleau Forest, which was available to all and in very stark contrast to the formal French gardens that you would see in the cities. So the leaders of the Barbizon School were Corot, Millet, and Rousseau. So here's a portrait of Camille Corot painting in the Fontainebleau Forest. And here's an example of a painting by Theodore Rousseau. One can really see the influence of the Barbizon school on a number of early photographers. So here's our friend Gustave Le Gray. He did several fo uh, forest studies in Fontainebleau. So he might be right alongside one of the well-known painters of the day. Gustave Le Gray was an early proponent of the artistic merit of photography. He advanced the idea that too much photographic detail would leave an image cold. He advocated that one should choose to either soften the picture plane through intentional lack of focus or, conversely, through sharply defined surfaces. Le Gray's mastery of light and form would be a precursor to the work of the Impressionists in the later part of the century. Le Gray was not bound to the precise character of the negative. He often retouched clouds, removed certain elements, and also used vignetting, the process of darkening the edges of a frame, to accentuate the center in his printing. And in England, we have John Constable, the landscape painter of renown, as well as William Henry Fox Talbot photographing the forests of England. And James Knight. Andre Giraud. He was a landscape painter who also experimented with photography. Okay, the next topic I'd like to discuss is the tableau vivant. And another very interesting form of fine art photography is found in the work of William Lake Price. Working largely from the tableau vivant, uh, this is a scene that's carefully constructed with live actors and models. Uh, Price makes a photographic image of a very famous literary figure. These images drew upon the tradition of the inspirational or morally uplifting painting that was a goal of the current painting style, Romanticism. Oscar Raylander was a former painter who made a living copying old master paintings. He was an early experimenter with combination printing as well. Um, this is the technique of using many negatives to create a single composition. This is one of his more simple examples uh, with St. John the Baptist in a charger or a plate. And you can see that his work became far more sophisticated in images like this. So like William Lake Price, Raylander liked to work from the tableau vivant, creating scenes from literary or historical events to photograph. Perhaps his most famous image, however, is this one, in which Raylander imitates the structure of the very famous Raphael painting, The School of Athens. So this is the two ways of life. In order to compete with allegorical painting, photographic subject matter needed to be morally uplifting or instructive as well. So in this piece, a sage introduces two youths to life. The one on the left embraces the moral life of honest industry, and on the right, one is about to venture into a life of dissipation and debauchery. So this image is made of more than 30 individual negatives. The print was 31 inches wide, 
and had to be sewn together since paper did not actually come in such a large format. The scale of this image allowed it to be noticed on a gallery wall. Controversy surrounded this image, however, in that its detractors felt that it was a violation of the quote-unquote true nature of photography, while others felt that its trickery would not elevate it to the status of high art. So you can't win. And here's uh, the great painting, The School of Athens, uh, that was uh, in some ways the inspiration for the two ways of life. And I always like to throw this in here. I taught a class a few years ago uh, in which we looked at this particular image and uh, one group project was to recreate the image by giving each person in the class um, the pose and role that they should play so that it has the same structure of Ray Lander's two ways of life. Another photographer that worked with combination printing was Henry Peach Robinson, and he actually learned the technique from Raylander. The subject matter of this image was apparently found quite disturbing to the public at the time, who did not deem it appropriate to display uh, because it depicted a dying young girl. And though of course, there have been far more gruesome scenes that were acceptable in paintings. Somehow, the fact that this image was photographic made it far more disturbing to people. So this image was made using at least five negatives, and the compression of space is quite evident. Um, you have a sense of depth not quite being what it perhaps it should. So you have a different negative being used for the uh, the sky outside the window, the man at the window, the woman on the left, and then the two women on the right. This image shows a sketch that was done by Robinson in planning for the larger composition. Raylander and Robinson's combination printing challenged the notion that only painters could create scenes of allegorical and symbolic nature. They also challenged the notion that the photographer was simply a technician. So Robinson's fading away, the previous image that we looked at, was per actually purchased by Prince Albert of England, and he eventually became uh, very popular and well-respected in England. Robinson wrote a book called Pictorial Effect in Photography in 1869, which became a standard for fine art photographers. Here's another very sophisticated combination print made by Robinson. This is called Dawn and Sunset. And here he's presenting a symbolic portrait of three generations from infancy to old age. By using the combination method, Robinson was able to exercise greater control over his subject's poses, gestures, and expressions than he would, than would have been possible with a single exposure. Robinson's ideas and techniques dominated photographic discourse and sometimes even stifled other ways of thinking until the 1880s in England. Another interesting example of photography in this era is that of a man named Lewis Carroll, also known as Charles Dodgson. Lewis Carroll, of course, is the well-known author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. He was also an early photographer. So he does a series of images photographing young girls in various scenarios, um, including this one, which is of a young girl named Alice Little or Alice Liddell. Um, this is indeed the Alice of his stories. So he's actually widely criticized for making images that are sexually suggestive. And as is stated in Mary Warner Marion's uh, Photographer of Cultural History, uh, she says, quote, the child became a potent symbol of purity and simplicity. And Carol's pictures pivot on the girl's ignorance of the teasing sexuality of their poses, end quote. 
Here's another example of Lewis Carroll's images of little girls. And many of the little girls that he depicted were uh, indeed the children of his friends. Okay, the Pre-Raphaelites. So beginning in 1848, um, Many people were disenchanted with contemporary academic painting in the art world. And so the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood uh, becomes a symbol of this disenchantment. Um, instead, they choose to emulate the art of late medieval and early Renaissance Europe, um, and that all the way until the time of Raphael. So this is an art that's characterized by a minute description of detail, a luminous palette of bright colors, and subject matter of a noble, religious, or moralizing nature. In the mid-20th century in England, this is a period marked by political upheaval, mass industrialization, and a number of social ills. The Brotherhood, at its inception, strives to transmit a message of artistic renewal and moral reform by imbuing their art with seriousness, with sincerity, and truth to nature. So here's an example, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's The Daydream. And now we'll look at a photograph of Jane Morris, who was a model for The Daydream. So Jane Morris was the wife of William Morris, a painter of the time, who's most well known for the decorative arts. Um, but she was the model and muse of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The subject matter for the pre-Raphaelites was often drawn from literature and mythology, as we see the Lady Lilith and John William Waterhouse's The Lady of Shallot, which comes from a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And this is something that's illustrated by a number of pre-Raphaelites, painters, as well as photographers, as we see here in Henry Peach Robinson's version of The Lady of Shallot. This picture represents a vision of Dante's Beatrice at the precise moment of her death. It has a double subject for the principal figure is both Dante's Beatrice and Elizabeth Siddal. Um, the title, Blessed Beatrice, refers to the end of the Vita Nuova. This is an image by Julia Margaret Cameron. Julia Margaret Cameron's probably the best known photographer of the Victorian era in England. She received a camera as a gift from her children in 1863 at the age of 48. And within a decade, she produced around 900 images, many of which were sold to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Here we can see a very strong influence of Rossetti and the other pre-Raphaelites in Cameron's work. Cameron's out-of-focus images were at first a mistake. Uh, she explains that her early images were produced using a lens with the wrong focal length uh, for the distance that she, uh, that she would place her subject from the camera. Um, so that would cause this slightly out-of-focus effect. But she continued to use it, making the slightly blurred image her signature style. She felt that the images should be more dreamlike in quality. This very much suited her taste, both aesthetically and conceptually. Cameron's subject matter was biblical, mythological, uh, drawn from many of the same subjects as Renaissance painting, British lore and literature, and the pre-Raphaelites. Her work is often very atmospheric as opposed to others working with similar tropes or tableaus. Uh, for instance, Raylander and Robinson's sharply focused images. 
Her compositions were unique in the very close cropping of the head and the face. Um, and so this is a quote from Nathan Lyons. He says, her portraits represent a radical departure in thinking about photographic portraiture. The work possessed movement, a type of direct confrontation and a scale of the head within the frame that had nothing to do with other works being made photographically at the time. Her excitement about what she saw on the ground glass did not depend on the subject she was photographing, but on her own subjective response, end quote. Her work was highly criticized by other photographers of the day, calling it technically poor. And this is a quote that comes from the Scottish Photographic Journal. Mrs. Cameron exhibits her series of out of focus portraits of celebrities. We must give this lady credit for daring originality, but at the expense of all other photographic qualities. A true artist would employ all the resources at his disposal in whatever branch of art he might practice. In these pictures, all that is good in photography has been neglected, and the shortcomings of the art are prominently exhibited. We are sorry to have to speak thus severely on the works of a lady, but we feel compelled to do so in the interest of the art." End quote. The London Illustrated News, however, said this of her work, quote, the nearest approach to art, or rather the most bold and successful applications of the principles of fine art to photography, end quote. Her work was considered radical as she ignored many traditions that required exacting focus in photography and images. Cameron's models were often her friends and their children, sometimes her servants, as in this image of Mary Hiller. And her work depicts women in significant roles through history, literature, and religion. She had a particularly interesting style of portraying men in her work with freshly washed hair, um, uncombed, kind of unkempt looking, and here we see, of course, Sir John Herschel, the very famous pioneer of early photography and inventor of the cyanotype process and inventor of fixer. <laughs> Some images that Cameron completed we were done as illustrations for particular books, such as this one for uh, Tennyson's Idols of the King. And here we see a grown-up Alice Little, the same Alice Little that served as Lewis Carroll's muse as a small child. Like Cameron, another female photographer of the era, Lady Howard N, is known for making images using her daughters in poses that suggest that they are acting out scenes from various literary sources, such as Tennyson's The Lady of Shallot. Here we have At the Window. Lady Howard N's photographic studies often included her daughters as her models. She exhibited her work with the Photographic Society of London in 1863 and 1864 under the titles Studies from Life and Photographic Studies. And she was also awarded the Society's Silver Medals in both years. You'll notice that the window plays a prominent role in Lady Howard N's images. And finally, Lady Filmer is another interesting character in this particular era. Um, her work may well be the first example of photo collage or photo montage. Um, so she also did the watercolor imagery that you see in these compositions. So this is a collaged um, image 
So she's cut and paste smaller images, smaller portraits onto the page. And here you see a much more elaborate scene. She's known to have produced several albums full of fantasy and humor, um, also including the watercolor, of course. So you have, you know, the shift in scale of the different um, images of people within a single composition um, and decorated with this very kind of fanciful color palette. This plate comes from one of these albums. It's taken apart in the 1970s and is mainly uh, taking the royal family and Prince of Wales as subject matter. And here you see that her full name, Lady Mary Georgiana Caroline Filmer. And that's all for photography as art. Thank you for listening.